Hello Rocket Builders! It's been a while since the last video, but uh, the next two should be pretty interesting, so we're going to make up for lost time. What we're going to talk about is the 3D modeling and construction of the nose portion of the Saturn 1B, which includes the command module and the launch escape system. Today, we're going to concentrate on the command module. So, here we go! Remember folks, I've been certified to build and fly rockets up to level 3. If you don't have these qualifications, you might want to consider a simpler project and perhaps join one of your local or national organizations. Rocketry is a very safe hobby if you follow some very simple guidelines. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the command module. Now, if you're not familiar with the Saturn 1B, this is a pretty important portion of it because it's the part where the astronauts sat. Without them, a manned space mission is just a space mission. Um, now, there are a number of components to this. Uh, the command module, which is the part that housed the astronauts, was typically um, lumped together with the support portion that they would ride as their uh, spaceship going to and from the moon. Uh, it would be ditched before re-entry and only the command module would re-enter. Now, attached to this, there is also the launch escape system, if anything should happen during launch, it would safely propel them away from the main rocket, which might be undergoing a catastrophic failure, also known as an earth-shattering kaboom. Okay, so the command module itself was a shiny aluminum object. Uh, it was designed to meet up with the uh, lunar excursion module, or the LEM, which was contained inside the Saturn 1B or if you're on a Saturn V, uh, the portion of the Saturn V that was common, which is the S4B upper stage. Uh, there were some wings that separated. It turned around, made it with the lunar excursion module. Two of the astronauts transferred onto that, went down to the moon, came back up, and then all three returned home. Now, the service module was attached to this whole process. So it was also known as the Command Service Module, or CSM, in uh, a lot of documentation. When it came time to re-enter, uh, there was a portion connecting the two pieces called the umbilical, and it's just a big cover that contained wires and uh, supply lines and things like that, uh, contained in the Service Module, but not necessary for re-entry. So that was separated, the Command Module separated from the Service Module, and re-entered in the atmosphere, bringing the three astronauts back to Earth safely. Okay. Now, from a scale model point of view, the command module doesn't really matter much, uh, which may sound like an odd statement, except during a launch, it was covered by a protective fiberglass coating called the Boost Protective Cover. And as you see it at launch, it's that bright white object as opposed to the shiny silver of the command module. So as I mentioned it's just a fiberglass casing that goes over top of it and um, that's what we have to model, not the command module itself. Okay. Uh, when um, the rocket reached a safe altitude and the launch escape system separated from the rocket, that's when the uh, boost protective cover was also taken away with it, leaving just the command module for the final ascent into space, and the trip to the moon. Okay, scale information. I mentioned these diagrams before. Uh, these are a set of uh, scaled models done by a fellow named David Weeks, who uh, accurately diagrammed the entire Saturn 1B and Apollo systems. Um, there are a number of uh, drawings here. So you can see, for example, we just have the paint schemes for the different uh, missions of the uh, Saturn 1B. And it goes into some pieces we don't need. On the top here, for example, we have the Lunar Excursion Module. That's inside the rocket at launch. It's not something we're going to be modeling. Now, this was sold in two sets. One for the Saturn 1B launch vehicle, and one for the Apollo uh, Command and Service Modules, launch escape system, and so on. So that piece was actually common for both the Saturn V and the Saturn 1B, which is why it's sold as a separate set. Um, 
they cost you about as much as a, a low power model rocket kit. So you might think it's a little bit expensive, but in the grand scheme of a model this large and this detailed, it actually wasn't much at all. Okay, so this is a diagram showing the uh, command module. Uh, you can also see part of the launch escape system and the service module as well. Now, as I mentioned, not all of this detail is of interest to us because we're not actually looking at the command module. We're looking at the boost protective cover. But luckily, that's on here as well. So that's what we're going to do. Now, these diagrams are drawn to scale. They don't have written dimensions for everything. So one of the tools you're going to find indispensable, and this is true for scale modeling as well as 3D modeling. You'll find uh, it's so indispensable that you'll wonder how you ever lived without it. And that is a set of calipers. Okay. So I have a digital set that works in both uh, inches and millimeters. Typically being Canadian, I do think metric, but uh, everything Apollo is still uh, imperial. So uh, yeah, this has the convenience of doing both. The other thing you're going to need is a calculator. So for example, this one is drawn at, uh, what is it? A quarter inch to uh, uh, one foot. Um, so that's what, 148 scale? And we're doing this in a different scale, so you need to do some conversions. So you'll notice tucked into my um, caliper box, for example, I've got crib sheets with all kinds of uh, notes about what I measured and what I converted and so on. So you do want to keep notes. You are going to go back and refer to them. That is not my recommended approach, but it's doing a lot of this in hotel rooms, so it's like whatever paper was available in the hotel room. Um, so yeah, most of my drafting I did well on the road. Okay, we have the diagram, we have our measurements, we need to start drawing. This is far and away the most complex 3D model I have ever created. Um, not that I've done a lot, but uh, I've certainly done some and this is, uh, this is definitely up there. Um, <clears throat> In order to do this, I had a few options for different CAD systems because I was doing a lot of travel for work at the time and a lot of my CAD work was being done in hotel rooms and various continents around the world. I wanted something that wasn't online, so Fusion 360 I know is commonly used by a lot of 3D modelers, um, but that really wasn't an option for me because a lot of times the internet wasn't uh, that good a connection. I also um, use a MacBook Air when I travel because of its light weight, but it's not necessarily a workhorse. So uh, I had my desktop PC when I was back at home. I wanted something that was multi-platform. So I used a program called FreeCAD. It is open source, links below. Um, and it takes some getting used to, but so does FreeCAD. Um, there are some quirks about 3D modeling in general that you just need to uh, become familiar with. Um, and there's no escaping that no matter which system you use. Now, in my case, the version of FreeCAD that was available at the time, 0 0.16, um, it really wasn't very sophisticated and for a lot of the detail I needed to do, I found was pretty insufficient. Now, the 0 0.17 release was being developed at the time. I am a programmer, I can build from, uh, build from source, so uh, that's the route I chose to go. Um, the release product is out there now, so uh, you have all the features available to you that I didn't have at the time. Um, now, part of the fun of that, of course, is being a pre-release version. You get the pre-release bugs. I certainly found a few. Uh, the forums were very helpful to me just in determining, first of all, is it a bug or am I just thinking things wrong, which happened a lot. Um, and they <laughs> helped calm me down through some of my frustrations. So uh, a very helpful user community, uh, and that's always a bonus. Um, the bugs I found got fixed, and in the release is pretty solid now. Now, uh, I am using my MacBook Air to show you this. This is not my PC, so um, yeah, I'm actually using my MacBook Air. Uh, you will find, however, that the macOS version is still a little bit buggy. The developers of the uh, software aren't Mac people. Um, 
and I could go through the pain of setting it up to uh, build it on my Mac, but like I said, this isn't a very capable machine. So I'm running it in a Linux virtual machine as, uh, instead, and that's what you're going to be seeing here as I walk you through the uh, steps. Okay, so this is built in pieces. Um, it's too large to fit on a 3D printer as it is, unless you have a much more expensive 3D printer than I have. So what we see here is the uh, complete assembly of the command module with the launch escape system. So it has the uh, tower that holds the uh, rocket structure as well as the rockets that would um, lift and separate the um, capsule from the main booster if the catastrophic happened. Okay, so what we're going to look at uh, at this point is just the command module itself, so this bottom piece. We're going to look at the launch escape system and the details for it in the next video. Okay, so let's switch to the command module. Okay, so as you can see, there's a lot of details on here, um, including, for example, the... Uh, let me see if I can scroll this. Uh, okay, so you can see, for example, the umbilical section that... Um, uh, connects the command module to the service module. There are various pieces like the mounts for the launch escape tower. Um, there's the covers for um, the crew entry uh, portion and so on. Now remember, for the most part, this is just one piece of fiberglass. It, it's made in sections, and you can see the sections separated by these ribs, um, but it is a single unit and when the launch is successful, the launch, is, the launch escape system will actually lift this off of the rocket and take it away. So this whole system was tested using the famous Apollo Little Joes. Um, so it was pretty well established that it would work before um, humans got on board. Okay, so this is built in pieces. Now what I'm showing you right now is a sketch of the general uh, shape of the capsule. Okay, so we're going to have a plastic portion that's fairly thick right up to the top and this is the forward portion of the boost protective cover that the launch escape system will attach to. And then the part that goes down over the cover, we have a piece that goes on the outside of the body. Uh, this is uh, effectively the shoulder for the uh, outer portion of the fuselage for the um, service module. And then we have another one for the inner portion because remember there's a stuffer tube inside. It goes on to the bottom where it has a nice solid frame at the bottom. Okay, so this is half of the command module in outline. And what we then do is we revolve it. So we spin it around. Okay, to this we can attach details, but at this point it would be foolish. What we want to do is prototype. Okay, so we're going to do um, two different things. One of which is we're going to make sure it actually fits in the body tubes like it's supposed to. Um, and we're going to um, just check that out, make sure uh, the fits are fine. Uh, you may have to do a little bit of sanding, but the plastic can be sanded fine. Um, that's not a real problem. So print it out first. Now here you see an image of my first attempt at a print. 14 hours in, the power goes out. Time to start again. Okay, so what I did instead was uh, I sectioned it off. So I created basically taking this sketch I did a uh, section where I just had this forward portion with, um, as we add the uh, uh, the brackets for the um, or the attachment points for the launch escape system, uh, I created uh, just to chop that section off so I can just print the forward part. I can print it in two hours instead of twenty especially considering I didn't need uh, the bulk of it. I did very similar for the bottom portion where I made sure it fit in the body tubes the way it was supposed to. Okay, so when prototyping especially, you're probably going to have the measurements off just by a fraction, 
but that's all it takes and you need to do adjustments. So instead of spending many hours and a lot of plastic printing a piece that will never be used, just print enough of it to check the fit. For example, on the bottom portions here, I only printed like maybe about a 10 millimeter height. It's just enough to, uh, to check the fit and the dimensions and so on. Okay. So you can see in this image, for example, I uh, had printed out the launch escape system that I'll talk about in the next video and put it in uh, place. Everything fit. Life was good. Okay. So at that point, I can start drawing details. Okay. So one of the next details I added was uh, one of the reaction control systems. Now, it is important to remember that um, this is the boost protective cover. Okay. So... The real one on the command module, they were just um, nozzles, basically. This is a small rocket that is used to control the direction or the attitude of the rocket. But the boost protective cover is a cover for the nozzles. So you're not actually designing nozzles. Now, if you look at some of the diagrams, you can see that even though you have uh, an indented portion in the middle, it really is a cover and not the actual nozzle. Uh, so there are a few points where that is important to remember. Um, otherwise, you're creating a detail that may in your mind be correct, but it isn't accurate to uh, its function on the actual rocket. Okay, so let's see how I design that. And what I will do is I will take away the other piece and we'll look at just the reaction control system. Okay. So... One of the things you will see here, if I can get it scaled in correctly, is that this is actually a, uh, a long object that's printed in one of the planes and extends all the way out. Okay, I was able to add the details to it and so on, but it doesn't give you that nice rounded portion around the side of the capsule. It's kind of flat and square. Okay, so if I go back and add the, uh, the base capsule, you can see that I also exaggerated it and extended it out quite a bit. Okay, so how do I fix that? Well, I basically did two grooves. If I look at the sketch for the first one, um, you can see where the sketch is located. Now I have it so that the rear portion is actually inside the plastic for the module, and that just helps the model merge better. It is a quirk of one of the uh, pieces of software. Uh, and the outer portion uh, gives it that nice rounded shape on the front of the capsule. Okay, so that's going to cut this portion and this portion out. Okay, so if I go and look at the groove, you can see I've got the piece I need. Now I did that a second time to remove the back portion. Okay. So if I go back and add the rest of the capsule, you can see it fits into place. And I did the same thing with the remaining details. So again, I bring it all the way out from the beginning, do the grooves in front and back. Okay, now if I go turn this around and look inside, um, it's a bit difficult to see, but you can, you can see it's no longer uh, a rod that's going all the way through the model. It has actually been chopped off on the inside as well. Okay. And that's going to simplify printing times. It does mean you don't need support structures to build useless pieces, saves on plastic, all of the above. So those are the basic techniques I did for this. Now, in terms of getting to the final model, okay, there were a lot of uh, things I had to do. Uh, what do we got? Let's just get this finished up. Okay. So we make more pieces, more reaction control systems. Some of these things, you could have done things like um, um, uh, adding polar coordinates, and that allows you to duplicate things in the round. There were a lot of features that I didn't use this in this because, remember, this was pre-release software. Some of the features didn't work that well. Some actually weren't there yet when I was doing it. So you can actually do this better now than you could when I was doing it. Okay. So what I just added there was the umbilical. No, not quite yet. I have to add the pieces. Okay. 
Now what I'm doing right now by clicking all these things is just going through it in the sequence I created it. So you can see the same sort of deal. I had it out and extended and then created my grooves to uh, bring it back into uh, um, the shape I required. These verticals, like I said, the, the, um, the capsule was actually sectioned uh, and they were identical size sections. So that's uh, uh, definitely a place where I could have done um, some uh, polar rotations and duplicated pieces I'd already done. But again, this didn't work. Now, I also found with all these details, I was reaching the limit of the software. Um, so when I did the merging, I actually had to merge in a couple of pieces. Okay, so if we go and look at this capsule now, we can see we have a lot of details. Now for reference on this, um, looking at a two-dimensional diagram, go away, uh, isn't always the easiest way to uh, envision this. Uh, so what I did for some of the pieces, for example, was I got the um, uh, the capsule that's part of the uh, Apogee Components <laughs> Saturn uh, 5 kit. Um, and they use the same for their Saturn 1B and for their uh, Little Joe kits. And just had a good three-dimensional uh, visualization of, of what was there and what it required. So uh, definitely look at multiple sources. The drawings were excellent for dimensions. Um, but sometimes visualization was a little more difficult. Um, so use whatever you have at hand. Now inside the rocket, I wasn't sure if I was going to be um, adding uh, nose weight or not. So I added some uh, supports for um, uh, for filling with lead weights and pouring in epoxy because same thing with the standard plastic nose cones you use on your um, high power rockets. Uh, epoxy doesn't really stick to this very well, so that's something you need to um, to bear in mind. Okay, uh, you can see here as well along the along the base I have a solid plastic piece. The thought was to have a D-ring uh, loop around that. It turns out the holes here aren't big enough to get a D-ring in there, and I don't want to make them any larger, so I actually just uh, used a few wraps of Kevlar around that and attached the uh, D-ring to that, and that worked quite nicely. So now I have a 3D uh, model that I can export and print, and this is where things got a little bit interesting. Uh, definitely where having a working 3D printer is uh, valuable. So I did the export, um, and the first print, um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, didn't really turn out that well because um, not all of the portions were fused together into a single solid model and it just uh, parts just kind of especially the smaller details just kind of came off a little bit and they didn't look quite right because they weren't properly modeled and fused together uh, so a second print was required however i wasn't able to do that so when it first flew it used the first print it was functional it's not the final i still have to print another now, in terms of printing this, this is when I was having some serious problems with my own personal 3D printer. I, I, I had problems with the heated bed, which means pieces weren't going to stick to it. Um, and there were vibration issues, which gave me very bad prints. So I did actually contract this out, which cost me a fair amount of money for a model this size. Had I been able to print it myself, um, first of all, it would have taken a significant amount of time, probably close to two days to print a model this large, this complex. Okay, it, it's not fast. The other is I would have used different plastic. When you get your 3D printer, you commonly use what's known as PLA, polylactic acid. It's very easy to print, very easy to work with. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why people use it. Under most conditions, it's a perfectly satisfactory material. Now, it does have some issues uh, as it pertains to rocketry. Painting is an issue, gluing is an issue, but that's true of most of the materials. My original plan had been to print this out of ABS. So that's the same ABS that you typically use in your models. 
ABS is a particularly difficult plastic to work with. It is very heat sensitive. Uh, you do need to um, enclose your printer in uh, a box of some sort so you don't get drafts and you keep some of the heat inside. It needs to maintain that heat while it's printing and an open chassis like most 3D printers have just doesn't support that. Again, it's easy to fix. All you have to do is um, just enclose it somehow. The other thing about ABS is the layers separate. So if it gets, if it cools too quickly, you're going to get uh, the pieces just kind of pulling it apart. You're, you're very likely to get it off of the heated bed, for example, and um, the layers themselves, so the model might separate a bit. Um, so that's another problem with ABS. Uh, where I was having problems with my heated print bed, even if I had the vibration issues figured out, I still would have had issues with that. Now, one of the issue, one of the reasons why you want it with ABS is uh, heat. So PLA, uh, it has a glass point where it starts to melt again. That's relatively low. It's about 60 Celsius. Um, so if it's sitting out in a hot sun, like in the in the desert of Black Rock, for example you might have some issues with the plastic melting. I'm not flying in the uh, Black Rock Desert, but uh, if you're going at any significant speeds, uh, you might also have some uh, frictional melting. Um, the nice thing about ABS is it's got a higher glass temperature, so it, it's uh, 100 Celsius before you have that issue. You don't wanna be flying supersonic with a uh, 3D printed nose cone, but you can uh, fly faster than uh, PLA and certainly I'm not flying supersonic for this model anyway, so I'm okay with the ABS. Um, so with all the issues we've had, uh, I've mentioned, so an incorrect uh, model because the, uh, the parts weren't properly fused um, with the incorrect plastic and so on, I do plan on reprinting this. I have been working on my 3D printer, but I still have the vibration issues, so um, that's gonna be the subject of another video. Uh, so I had been hoping to get an example print for you here. That's still not happening. Uh, that's still to come. So in terms of man hours, um, I honestly don't know how much time I spent on this. It was over the course of several months, again, working in the evenings in hotel rooms. So I certainly didn't um, write down and log the hours I kept. Uh, but it was a very involved process. The nice thing about this is I have a working uh, model I can make modifications. So for example, if I want to uh, change the base for um, How it attaches to the rocket itself I can do that or if I just want to scale it up and scale it down I can actually do that without even changing the model. I can do that from within the 3d printer Okay, so that's the command module uh, Next time we're going to look at the launch escape system that had its own set of challenges some of which were actually pretty simple uh, but there are some techniques that I use that are a little different from what I used here that I'll be uh, happy to share with you as well. Um, even though I use FreeCAD for this, a lot of these techniques would be applicable to other design packages as well. Um, you're going to have to learn your package and figure out how to be able to do a lot of these details. There are also probably parts that I could have done better, partly constrained by a uh, pre-release version partly constrained by lack of knowledge, so I'm better now, I could probably do it better. Uh, but if you have some suggestions for things you uh, would love to see changed, uh, by all means, let me know. Now, the nice thing for you, I've done all this work. As I've mentioned, you can scale this up, you can scale this down within your 3D printing software. You don't need to redesign this, so the links are down below. You can download it, Use it freely for non-commercial purposes. Uh, I would love to see this fly on somebody else's model. If you do so, send me a picture. I'd love to see it. Um, it's not the same as the Little Joe, despite uh, some of the smaller kits using that. I am actually working on versions for the Little Joe as well that will work with some standard body tubes as opposed to my uh, homemade body tubes, so you can work with different scales as well. Uh, but that's been um, kind of a background task that I haven't been ready to build, so it hasn't been of high priority. But there you go, the command module. Uh, let me know what you think. If you like it, subscribe. If you don't like it, subscribe. Uh, tell your friends, and uh, I'll see you in the next video when I talk about the launch escape system. Until then, keep building, keep flying.